So, welcome everybody to this uh, class on moduli. I just have a small technical problem because b before I start, I want to close my. Uh, where can I close this? Okay, here we go. Sorry for the inconvenience. We are, have still to adjust to our technical problems. Uh, so we already had yesterday at the beginning, not everybody was here, a small video about cubes, one cube moved through the other one. And today I showed you a video which is not related to the course at all. But just for those who are waiting for the transmission to have some enter entertainment. So there's a joint feature to these two videos because both carry the name of Prince Rupert. So Prince Rupert, that's uh, a guy who was interested in mathematics. So maybe I write it here. And when you Google it, either Rupert's drop what you saw today and yesterday it was the cube. So these are funny phenomena and uh, I think it's quite amusing to see what's going on here. Okay, so before I start, let me make two uh, comments. First, uh, for you it's just a usual internet class. For me it's a little bit exciting because there are so many people all over Europe watching this. And we don't know how the techniques work with this transparent board and with the camera. I should, yesterday I realized that I never looked in the camera. I always looked down there and here and there. So I will try to fix the camera, not so easy. So I was once invited to give a lecture at Harvard in front of four Fields medalists and one Abel Prize. So this was also kind of exciting, but altogether it's a wonderful experience. So when I prepared the class of today, I enjoyed so much the mathematics I'm going to talk about that I hope that I can transmit this joy and this pleasure of doing mathematics. And the second anecdote or the second comment I want to make to you is how do we observe and how do we invent in mathematics? I'm not going to answer this question, but I want to give you a small example related to the Nobel Prize in Medicine or Physiology, which was attributed yesterday. Okay, maybe you have heard about it. The Nobel Prize was about cold and hot feeling on the skin. Did you ever observe, and probably you did, but maybe you did not realize that you observe, that there are two features when you touch, let's say, hot or cold water or some other objects, first, the information to the brain is delayed. In the first milliseconds, you don't feel anything, which is strange, because most other sensors in our body, for instance, the eye, they have an immediate response in the eye, in the brain. But the feeling of cold and warm has some delay. I don't know why this delay occurs, probably it is a transmission, but it's kind of a little bit surprising. But more surprising is another feature. And you can tell me afterwards by mail or in the chat if you have experienced this. When you turn on the water in the, in the shower and you, don't, you didn't check whether it will be cold or warm, once you feel the, something, you cannot say whether it is warm or cold. In the first milliseconds, in the first moments, it is ambiguous. It could be cold and warm, and within the next few milliseconds, you decide it is warm or cold. Did you ever experience this? Maybe not, but you can try tomorrow in the shower. Just close your eyes, turn the, the wheel around, and then you will feel it. Okay. So <clears throat> I am telling you these small stories also because this class is an experiment to transport not just uh, very dry mathematics, but put it a little bit in a cultural and philosophical context, especially the, 
the theory and the concept of moduli spaces is some basic idea in mathematics classifying objects. Okay, so I want, as I mentioned already in the yesterday, in the first half until mid November, I will mostly focus on this phenomenology, what ideas and what concepts led to the concept of moduli space. And then, in the second half, we will focus more on concrete examples and on the case of endpoints on the, on the projective line, subject to the action of PGL2, the group PGL2. Okay? So, any questions so far from your side? So, we, I will start. So, I realized that yesterday, maybe I my writing was too big. I have to economize because the transparent board is not so large. So I will try to write a little bit smaller and to have two, two boards uh, so that I have, don't have to clean so often. So we are on October 5 today. And uh, as I told already most of you yesterday, the class is live streamed by Zoom. It is recorded and will be, the link will be put on the website. And uh, you will also have typed notes yeah, within a delay of a few days. So today we are October 5 and the topic is equivalence. Let me say it, equality and equivalence. And we had a couple of examples yesterday. You didn't miss anything yesterday. Everything is in the notes. It was just to tease you a little bit and to stimulate discussion. Okay. So we start quite elementary. We recall what an equivalence relation is. So this is the topic one. So this is if x is a set. Then we have R, a subset in the Cartesian product. And uh, we write for X, Y in R, we just write X equivalent to Y as usual. And then we have the three axioms. A, X is equivalent to X. B, X equivalent to Y is equivalent to y to x. So this is uh, reflexivity. This is symmetry. And then we have, of course, transitivity, x, y, y, z implies x equivalent to z, transitivity. So, all students take this for granted. That's a good definition. But you might want to impose extra conditions. Yeah? And it's not completely clear if you have never seen this definition to invent it. Yeah? Of course, it is motivated by the notion of equality. Uh, but these are the good concepts. Usually in mathematics, it takes quite a while to develop an object. For instance, the concept of manifold took many years to evolve and to be become precise. Okay, But of course, equivalence relations are a very simple topic. So, ah, I forgot to put the microphone. I have my technician here, Markus, who is helping me out every other minute. So, <clears throat> we will have two concepts there. Equivalence classes. Which maybe we write them like this or like this. So these are all Y in capital X, Y equivalent to X. Then we will have uh, maybe I write it like this. This is a set of all equivalence classes. Okay, so that's, of course, first semester in mathematics. 
But to understand this set is not so easy. So that's the first goal. Understand in whatever sense you want x modulo this. Okay? So for instance, we want to put some topology on it or geometry or some algebraic st structure and so on. So that's one goal which is immediate. Yeah, we want to understand objects up to equivalence. We choose some equivalence which seems appropriate to us, which is interesting. And then we want to find uh, this set of equivalence classes. And then we also want to have a system of representatives. So what is this? So we could also call this normal form. So today I will not be very precise. It's just to, to sketch a little bit the, the main ideas. We will be more precise later on. So what does this mean? Pick for each alpha. Now I just write alpha for the equivalence class. So alpha is a set, a distinguished element x in alpha. Now, of course, distinguished is not defined yet, but we will see many examples in a second. Okay. So this distinguished element is often called the normal form or a possible normal form of the equivalence class of x. Yeah? So of course, this alpha will then be just the equivalence class of x. So already, this very simple outset gives rise to many interesting problems and questions. For instance, how do you pick an element? You don't want to pick it one there and one there. You always want to follow the same rule to pick your element. Yeah? You want to have some continuity. If equivalence classes are close to each other, the normal forms should be close to each other. Okay? You want to study how these normal forms behave in families. Yeah? So if you have a family of whatever family means, you have a family of equivalence classes, how do the normal forms behave with it? Okay. So that's kind of more general to modular problem, but for a starter, this is just okay. So I want to give you, I think, 10 or 8 different examples. You know all of them, but this, these examples are just to show how widespread already this concept of equivalence class is. So I see in, on my screen that there was a technical problem. Uh, sorry, just a second. I got I lost the zoom connection. Can you can you write me in the chat if you still if you still hear me? Okay. Yeah. And you see me also? Okay. So for some reason the, the monitor uh, kind of collapsed, but let's continue. Okay. So we are with the examples. So of course we would be now in a in the presence class, we would, I would ask you to give me examples and we would discuss about it. This is not possible, but I will give you just a few examples. So the first very important uh, equivalence notion is isomorphic objects. So 
many, many things we can look at up to isomorphism, vector spaces, groups, rings, algebras, I'm starting very basically and, and slowly. We will be, we'll be doing much more complicated things later on. Then we could compare curves, algebraic curves or algebraic varieties. Whenever we have a notion of isomorphism, we can look at these objects up to isomorphism. Then we could take lattices, graphs, then geometric objects or shapes in Rn, like triangles, tetrahedra, platonic solids, and so on. So you see already that the variety of isomorphisms is huge. Okay. So we have different types. of isomorphism, and each time this space of representatives or the, the set of all equivalence classes will change. Okay, so we have continuous, linear, according to the context, of course, differentiable, analytic, Biregular in algebraic geometry, which means essentially algebraic polynomial given by polynomial equations, then we can have it. We can look at local. So if we have two objects, let's say two geometric objects, we can look at them locally or globally. Yeah? For instance, at the variety, we can just pick a point and look there. So I will mention also this local against global. Local is usually easier than global, but both is interesting. So one thing which you might uh, observe here, and I put it in parentheses, is that in geometric objects, you have the concept of self-similarity. So this is, these are the, the fractals. Everybody, I assume, has heard about fractals. This uh, Julia sets. So I'm not going to explain all items which appear in the class. You can easily find it on the internet. So fractals have this property. If you zoom in, the shape looks similar as the whole picture. Yeah? That's also a kind of isomorphism, but you have to make it precise what it means. Yeah? OK. Now, one thing which happens here is that the isomorphisms are between different objects, so they don't form a group. They need not form a group, yes, because you have an isomorphism between different vector spaces, Okay, not the same. So this will give rise to the notion of groupoid. Group weight is something which is similar to a group, where you can still compose whenever everything is defined. Okay? Of course, if you have from V to W, between vectors, this is a map, and then you have a map G to Z, then you can also take the composition G composed with F. Okay? But these maps F and G here are not isomorphisms in a group. Okay? So that's, that's maybe the most prominent examples in mathematics. We always look up to isomorphism. Yeah? So <clears throat> maybe one thing which is funny here, what about names of elements? That was a question which appeared yesterday. I'm not going to answer it. What about the names of the objects? So yesterday, we compared a set ABC and the set maybe X prime, A prime, 
b prime c prime. So just a one minute of philosophy or logic, what does it mean a, b, c? What is the object behind? Can we make it precise or do we just assume it's something, we don't care what it is? So if you want now to define whether x and x prime are equivalent or even equal, you have to say, I don't care about the names. Yeah? But maybe you want to care about the names. So calling an object by name or by letter is a very basic human feature. Okay? We constantly do it, and actually we only talk about names and think that the objects are well understood and behind. Okay? <clears throat> Those were the isomorphic objects. So now, today I will just try to clean like this. And uh, will not, not be perfect, but we spare a little bit of time. I hope that you can, that the writing, the handwriting is OK, and that also I took today a, a blue shirt so that you, I hope that you can see it nicely. So this is not perfect, but on a usual blackboard, it's also never perfect. OK, I should work. So please give feedback if some <clears throat> things are very disturbing technically. Now, another example would be B. I want to call it logically equivalent statements. So this is, of course, something very different from the isomorphism from before. But this appears also very often. Actually, there are almost all theorems, or many, are just an equivalence between certain statements. Okay? So let me call this various versions of the same result. So when I give this type of examples, I would like to invite everybody to send me better examples or more interesting or very sophisticated examples so we can add them to the notes. And it will help everybody to see a more comprehensive picture. So here I only have very simple examples. For instance, there are at least three versions of the hahn banach theorem. Probably there are more. Uh, at least two are very popular. The third one is the classical one. Uh, and uh, maybe I put them in the notes. Okay. Then uh, also definitions have, of course, equivalent statements, which, for instance, uh, the definition of Netherian, of Netherian rings, you have the ascending chain condition, ACC, which is equivalent to finite generation of ideals. Okay. Then continuing in commutative algebra, you have the, the concept of flatness, flat modules. If you don't know what a flat module is, don't worry. We don't need it. But there are many different characterizations of flat modules. Then in complex analysis, we have analytic maps is the same as holomorphic maps. So once you define it by Cauchy or convergence, and analytic you define by power series, then uh, uh, elliptic curves can be identified. This is my symbol for identification, or maybe I, yeah, with lattices. And again, with polynomials of degree 3, cubic polynomials. So I don't want to enter here very much, but I just want to <clears throat> give you examples where you have very different ways of describing the same object. Okay, That's what I want to call logically equivalent statements. Now, C, 
this is now a different type again of equivalence relations. And I just give you two examples. When we define the real numbers, definition of R as the completion of Q with respect to the Archimedean norm, then we use equivalence classes of Cauchy sequences. Okay. There are other constructions of R. You can also define it by universal property. But when we work with R, you always choose a representative system, a system of representatives by just by taking the decimal expansion. Representative. you take decimal expansion. So that's almost unique. Of course, you know that 0.9999 is equal to 1. But up to this, it is unique. So <clears throat> a similar construction appears when you define L2, let's say, over R, the square integrable functions. And you take the modulo those with integral 0 in order to get a Banach space, to, in order to get a complete space. So again, you take equivalence. So when I write here modulo, I mean up to the equivalence given. So two functions are equivalent if the integral of their difference is 0. OK? So concerning r, here I just took the usual completion of q with respect to the absolute value. You could also take the periodic completion, and then you get, again, equivalence classes of Cauchy sequences, but of course uh, the periodic numbers, which are quite different from r. So I, I guess that this kind of cleaning will not work for for long. In any case, I plan to have a break, a five minutes break in the middle of the class so that I can clean carefully the blackboard. But for the moment, we will try to do it like this. OK. Are you fine so far? Everything OK? Uh, I'm not able to read the chat because uh, I have a monitor, but it's uh, it's kind of far away, and of course, I have to manage several things. So let me continue with my list of examples. <clears throat> there is one notion of equivalence which is, again, very different. Equivalence via, I think you cannot read this well, but deformations. I'm sorry, I think I have to use my vacuum cleaner. You can read it well once it is dry, as Chiara observed last time. So please be patient. So what does this mean? Equivalence via, via deformation is essentially homotopy theory. So we have homotopic loops, closed paths. Now I'm not going to repeat the, the definition. If you take, let's say, in R2, two closed paths continuous, then by homotopy, you may try to move them one into the other. And then you get the fundamental group. Pi 1 of your topological space x. So for instance, if you take pi 1 of r star, which is r minus the origin or any point, then you will just get z. Okay, as a group. 
So this already means this that here is already a system of representatives. OK? No? Pi 1 is a, the collection of all homotopy classes, equivalence classes of closed loops, or of closed paths, which are loops. And this z here, which is the winding number, so let's say gamma goes to in the gamma, which is just the winding number. Okay. So this is one equivalence notion which is very, in topology, uh, very frequent and well studied. Uh, there is also a different uh, notion in, top in differential geometry, which is called cobordism of manifolds. So not all of you are familiar with this, but I give you one picture instead of talking a lot. So we want to compare two curves, closed curves, real curves. And so this is always the same picture here. We will see it as the boundary of a surface. So here we have, maybe we call this here x, and this we call it y1, y2, and y is y1 union y2. So of course, my picture is too elementary and too simple to, to show something. But the notion of cobordism is saying that the boundaries of a manifold, a manifold with boundary, may have several components. And these components are cobord to each other. That's again the equivalence relation, which is of a completely different flavor than the other ones. Okay, and uh, one more. So this is homotopy theory, cobordism, and I have a little bit of space here. I want also to mention Schubert calculus here, which is again a notion of equivalence. So Schubert calculus tries to, to count objects, geometric objects mostly in projective space. So there are many different uh, circumstances where you want to do this. And Schubert developed a calculus which allowed him to do this. So I will give you just one example. So let me take here. Namely, you want to count the following given, sorry, given four general lines in P3R in the three dimensional projective space, how many? lines intersect all four. That's maybe the most prominent and famous example of Schubert calculus. So now I, have, I cannot draw anything, but I can use my sticks maybe. So you have, I will give you the answer. And the answer is by equivalence. So here you, I hope you can see this, maybe not very well, but you know what two lines, so they are, of course, they are not, con, uh, they are disjoint and not parallel, even though it doesn't matter in P3, they would intersect somewhere. So you have here these real lines. And now, of course, if you have two lines, it's easy to find a third line going through both, you know, like this, but if you have four lines, it's not so clear. So in order to count this, Schubert said that this situation of these two lines is equivalent to the counting if I move these two. Okay? The number of lines intersecting all four will be the same, except in certain cases where maybe it becomes infinite. But if you move in the right way, the number will be the same. So what he does then is a fantastic trick. He takes one pair of these four lines and he lets them 
intersect like this. Okay? And he does the same with the other two lines. So he gets here a pair of intersecting lines. And here on the other side, you have another pair of intersecting lines. Okay, You don't see it well, but you know what I'm doing. And then you immediately see a line which goes through all four, namely the line passing through the two intersection points. Okay, So you already have one line going through all four. And Schubert's fantastic theorem is that if the lines are arbitrary, the same statement holds. Exercise for you, there is a second line. So the answer here is 2. So exercise. Answer is two lines. Okay. So find the second line. So how I'm going with time? Well, that's fine. I will make a break in ten minutes so I can continue. So that's about deformation number D. So now I will try to do this a little bit better. I think I do have to dry a little bit. So that's better like this. So we continue our examples. E, something, a keyword which appears very often in mathematics is classification. So you have many, many classifications. So I just mentioned finite simple groups, which is a, a huge theorem, the classification of finite simple groups, some 10,000 pages. Much easier is finite dimensional vector spaces, which we do in the first year of linear algebra, you can classify Hilbert spaces. You can classify all type of objects, elliptic curves, uh, planar graphs, platonic and Archimedean solids, lattices, uh, wallpapers. What else do I have here? Quadratic forms, so, <clears throat> and I could continue here quite a while. So classification is you always want to find a nice list at the end, possibly finite or a discrete series. Uh, it's a matter of taste whether you like classification or not. Uh, some people, like Abianca, completely protest and say classification is useless. So I don't completely agree, but there's some point to it. The, the funny thing is, once you have your list, and if it is finite, then you're kind of done. What do you do with it? But I want to mention one classification which has become very uh, prominent, which is the ADE classification. So the ADE classification <coughs> has many features. It appears in Lie algebras, in group theory, in singularity theory, in graph theory, classification of Dinkin graphs. So for those who are interested, uh, there's a paper of somebody called Durfee. And if you Google it, you will immediately find it. It is called 15 characterizations. Of simple singularities. 
So the point here is 15. So we have 15 essentially equivalent classifications of different objects. They're always the same ADE phenomena appearing. ADE corresponds to the classification of Dinkin graphs, Dinkin diagrams. And these are discrete series of examples which characterize all normal forms. So it's amazing to have so many different characterizations, but there is not one big theorem telling you all these must be equivalent. You have to prove it in each case by classification. In some cases, there is a direct equivalence, but in many cases, it is still open how to prove this directly. OK. Uh, then I want to finish before the break with this. We have conjugation plus similarity of matrices, essentially. We have the draw the normal form. We have various other normal forms. Uh, <clears throat> the step shape, according whether you use conjugation or similarity or congruence. Then if the matrices depend on variables, so if you have functions in your matrices, then we have also something which is called gauge transformation. Gauge transformations, which play the role in, <coughs> in differential equations, ordinary differential equations. And Finally, uh, I want to talk about triangles. The triangles will appear over and over. So of course, if you have a triangle like this, and oh, I'm very bad in drawing. So these should be the same up to a rotation. Then you want to declare them as equivalent. So you have the isometries of R2, so rotations and translations. And you declare two triangles equivalent if you have a movement like this, bringing one into the other. But you may also multiply with positive numbers, enlarge your triangles, and then you get a different, you get a different notion of equivalence. So it's funny, how would you do this? This is something for high school. Here, of course, you would just take A, B, C. OK. Uh, when you refer to this one, to the movements, so let me call this I. And here we take both together. And uh, we just, in order to find their system of representatives, we will take, without loss of generality, a less than b less than c. And then we want to take plus the triangle inequalities. And so the classifying space will be a polyhedral cone. in R3. So that's a cone which is half open and uh, whose faces are parts of hyperplanes. Okay? This would be the side lengths would correspond to, to SA2. And if you take, uh, if you allow also multiplication, enlargement of your triangles, then you just would take the angles, alpha, beta, gamma. Quite clear. OK, so I think that's a good moment to have a five minute break. Uh, you can do whatever I want. I will shut off the screen for a moment and we'll be back in five minutes. OK, I'm back again. I need my microphone. I hope you can see and hear me. Everything OK so far? Uh, otherwise, you will protest in some way. 
So this was the list of examples of very different type. The next <coughs> item I want to discuss is the most frequent uh, the most frequent appearance of equivalence relations, namely with respect to group actions. So this is number three, group actions. So we have x a set, or maybe a space, which means topological space, manifold, variety, g a group, and g acts on x. And equivalently, we could also take g a map in a group homomorphism into the bijections, the symmetry group of x. Okay. Action. So <clears throat> we have, of course, the usual objects, orbits, which I will denote gx or g times x. Then we have stabilizer, g sub x. Then we have the fixed point set x to the g. So here g is, of course, in g, x is in x. And then we have the orbit space, and that's our object of interest, orbit space, which we denote x, g. And we could also write just equivalence. These are the orbits g times x, x in capital X. And of course, x is equivalent to y if and only if gx equals gy, if and only if there exists g in g, y is gx. You are familiar with this, no? So there are so many examples of group actions. And constructing this orbit space in a reasonable way is arbitrarily difficult. Yeah? There are many, many situations where we can just don't say what it is. But we will at least study some cases where this is possible. So the goal is try to see x mod g as a geometric object. And again, we will have a couple of examples, a. So I apologize. My examples are very, very simple. But if you think about them, you will realize that something there's quite a lot behind. And we, we want to start from scratch. So we take r mod z, which is, of course, identified with the half open interval 0, 1. So maybe I should write here like this. And then this would be OK. So this is already a system of representatives, a nice one. But of course, a value very close to 0 should be very close to 1. So it is more appropriate to take this with a circle to identify this. So this would be just the interval, the closed interval, where we identify 0 and 1. Okay. So here we see already all concepts appearing. We have a nice system of representatives. And everybody will agree that this is the nicest one. Okay. But in general, there are various candidates. And of course, we can do this Rn mod L, L a lattice. So if we take, for instance, R2 mod the lattice generated by 1, 0, and 1, 1, then we will get, we have these two vectors. And then we get something which is also well known, which is a fundamental domain, which is, again, a system of representatives. Let me call it capital F. Okay. So this F here, which is half open parallelogram, plays the role of the half open interval here. No? Okay. And of course, you have here the length of the vectors and the angle. 
This again, this example pops up. This is related to, of course, those those who know two elliptic curves, which are inside algebraic geometry, but you can do it just with lattices. And this will be the torus. Geometrically, uh, you realize you glue along the opposite sides, and you get the torus T in R3. So that's a situation where you, you are happy. You, you even get a compact manifold. What else do you want? So still a very simple example is the following. We let R act on R2, T x, y goes to x plus t, y plus t. So here the orbits are just parallel lines. So here we have our coordinate system. And then you see it's easy to find a system of representatives. You just take any section here. Yes. OK. So that's uh, a situation where you control everything. But you, if you modify this example a little bit, you will see that you run into problems. Now we take R star acting on R2. That's maybe the first example where really something is happening. T x y goes to T x T inverse y. So here the picture uh, the orbits are hyperbolas, but then you have uh, the origin, which is a, a single orbit. And then I don't know how to draw this, but I will try. We have the two axes without the origin, which are also orbits. OK, so if we declare, if we now declare objects equivalent if they lie in the same orbit, how do we find R2 mod this equivalence relation? So <clears throat> of course, we have also the hyperbolas here. There is a, a certain problem because for most orbits, that works well. No? We choose a representative. How do we choose? Maybe we just intersect here no? with the diagonals. This will give us a unique representative of the hyperbolas. But for the three special orbits, this does not work. Yeah? So we have this orbit. We have this one. And we have the point. Uh, three special orbits. And it is not clear how to make a reasonable geometric topological space out of this, in particular, whether we can achieve that this is Hausdorff or separated. Yeah. So you see here, you have the notion of being close to each other for the hyperbolas, it's quite clear. No? If two hyperbolas are close to each other, you, will, you want that the red points are close to each other. You are not going to choose here the one point here and the other point here. No? You will do it in an organized manner. But as you approach the two axes, yeah, things become complicated. Yeah? And that's one reason is that the orbits have jumping dimension. But also that sometimes they are connected and sometimes they are not connected. Sometimes they are closed. They need not be closed. So that's already complicated. Yeah? And you have to expect that in many cases, you are just not able to give a nice structure on this space. Then, of course, we have projective space, Pn over any field. So this would be, let me do it over the reals, but mod r star, projective space. And here, <coughs> the orbits of r star are just the 
all lines. Okay. And uh, if you want to construct now a geometric object, what you do is, for instance, you cut these lines horizontally. So for each line, you get an intersection point. But at infinity, you have to add for the horizontal line. Okay. So you see, all these constructions, that's very classical. But there was always a need in mathematics to classify these spaces and also to have them compact, like the projective space. Okay. Now, of course, projective space can be also interpreted as hyperplanes in Rn plus 1. You have a dual version, of course, yeah. Pn dual hyperplanes. And uh, more generally, you can look at the Grassmannian uh, of dimension nk. These are the k-dimensional subspaces of n-dimensional vector space. Okay. And there are various ways to describe this, to define coordinates, to see it as a manifold. That's beautiful and works very well. Uh, one more item I want to mention is if we have a subgroup of GLN, and let me just take it over the complex numbers, but we could take any field. So this acts obviously on CN just by mult matrix multiplication. And hence, on the polynomial ring, Cx equals Cx1 up to xn. So if you have g on the polynomial p of x is defined, the action is just defined by acting on the variable and then evaluating p there. So for instance, the group g could be the group of permutations. Yeah? And you could ask, so this is very related to the problem of finding of finding moduli spaces and classifying spaces, you could ask which polynomials stay the same under this group action. So you get the notion of invariant polynomials. It depends very much on the group. And you know if G is the permutation group, then we will get the symmetric polynomials. And uh, one object which is of central interest and which in some sense reflects the space of equivalence classes or the space of orbits is the invariant ring. So in this situation, we have an algebraic object which plays the role of the geometric object of uh, our classifying space. I'm sorry, this does not work very well. We have to live with this. This cleaning process is not optimal yet, but we don't have the choice. And I ask you your patience. Now it's better. Markus, do you need some, something? No. <laughs> okay. So the the key concept here is the invariant ring. <clears throat> uh, the invariant ring C X G. So these are all polynomials P G p equals p. So this is easily seen to be a subring of the polynomial ring. And there is a famous theorem of Hilbert. So if g is, uh, 
you need some, adapt, uh, some, some assumption if G is reductive, which I'm not going to define, and Hilbert formulated it only in a more special case, then Cx is finitely generated. as a C algebra. Uh, that's uh, a theorem which, well, I mean, this was a catastrophe for mathematics in some sense, because invariant theory, which was very popular in the 19th century, was kind of killed with this. This was a universal theorem, and then Invariant theory fall asleep, and only much later in the 60s and 70s of the 20th century, Mumford and company reanimated this, and now invariant theory is again very popular. So here, the, the, once this is seen as a finitely generated C algebra, you will get an algebraic variety, yeah, which I call maybe capital X representing representing the modular space C n mod G. Okay. So that's the nice thing of the theorem, or one of the features of the theorem, that you can construct a geometric object which corresponds to the space of equivalence classes. Okay. So the, the notion of reductive group is pre precisely built so that this theorem holds. Okay. So I see that I, I'm going much slowly than I expected, but it doesn't matter. We just take our time and hope, I hope that you can enjoy a little bit and that you are still interested. So my, my last example in number three would be BGL n plus 1, which is GL n plus 1 over any field mod. Uh, now I have to define my field, maybe k star. Okay. The projective linear group. And we, this is the example we will study in all details, so I don't do them now, acting on p n k, and we will only do it for n equals 1. So we, the matrices will be a equals a, b, c, d. And of course, we are allowed to multiply with the, the whole matrix with a constant. And now this acts on z. z will be an element in p1 by a, z plus b, you have certainly seen this once. This is what is called Möbius transformation. Or it's also called fractional linear transformation. And uh, I mean, when I saw this for the first time, I, I guess I did not see the whole impact of this. So this is well defined not only for z, a value in the field, but you could also plug in infinity. It makes sense. Of course, you have here ad minus bc equals 1. So this will define an automorphism. This map here will define an automorphism of p1. And actually, these are all automorphisms of p1. So this uh, will be our main example in the whole class of a group action. And uh, it has the following property. This group action, group action on P1 is what is called sharply three transitive. And yesterday, I gave two exercises on this, where you should prove this. So sharply three transitive means that if you take, I will just tell you like this, if you take three different points, you can send them to any three different points by such a Möbius transformation. 
And the automorphism which does this, so the element, the matrix A is unique. Okay. So the three transitive means three different points can be sent to any three different points. And sharply means that there's only one matrix A which does this. Okay. So you cannot do it for four distinct points. Yeah? Four distinct points cannot be sent anywhere. And if you do, uh, just as a remark, for those who are interested, you could try PGL3 acting on P2. And now this is four transitive. So four points can be sent to four points, but not completely. Here, a geometric condition comes into play. Namely, if the four points, if three of the four points are collinear, lying on a line, then the image point will also lie on the on the line. So have to respect collinearity. And I hope that in the last week of our class in January, I want to address this question of endpoint in P2 under the action of GL3, PGL3. Yeah. So this is still unknown how to do it, but maybe until January we have found a solution. So that's uh, very interesting, but I will start with the action of PGL2 on P1. OK. It would be nice to have uh, more blackboards here, but that's not possible. Are you already tired? It may, might have been a long day for you, but we still have a couple of minutes and some nice things to look at. So again, I would like to invite everybody to, to write an email and to give feedback or to criticize or to suggest things. I see this as a common joint uh, project to try to make a digital online meeting where you don't fall asleep after 10 minutes. Yeah? I don't fall asleep, of course, because I'm teaching. But it would also be interesting for you and not too tiring. So let me come to the fourth item of today. So this is now the concept of moduli space, which is also called uh, classifying space. The terminology is not unique, or maybe configuration space. And in all generality, it is the goal is understand x modulo sum equivalence relation. But that's, of course, much too general. So as a geometric object. And in some cases, this is possible. So you want to make it in, a, for instance, a topological space. And we will, especially the endpoints on the line, we, this is not too difficult. And uh, so what does this mean as a topological? We want to make it in a, in a suitable sense in the following meaning. If uh, points in x are close, to each other, let me call them x and y, then the equivalence classes x and y should be similar. 
But that's something which we don't know how to define. Of course, for the hyperbolas, this hyperbola and this one, they will be similar to each other. And also for a triangle, this triangle and this triangle, they are similar to each other. But in general, it is very difficult. Yeah? So the problem is that the, there's no, a priori, there's no natural topology on the space of equivalence classes. Okay. And this makes things complicated. Assume that we have found a suitable topology, then the topological space might not be an algebraic variety. This would be the optimal, of course. And it might not be compact. Yeah? So comp compactification play also an important role. And why do we want to compactify? When we compactify, we add something, a boundary in some sense. And this boundary corresponds to taking limits of equivalence classes, taking limits in a suitable sense of equivalence classes. I give you a very simple example. Just take some points on the line. Take different points, n points on the line. Now, what would be a limit? A limit would be that some of these points come together. So maybe you have these, and then you just have one. OK. So you have convergence of points, and then things become complicated. And the question is, what type of limits makes sense? How do you define limit? It's not even clear what you understand with limit. And what are good limits to get a nice compactification? So nice is, of course, a word which is forbidden in mathematics. But I will try, at least in the example of n points on the line, I will try to give a precise meaning to what is nice. Okay. So <clears throat> uh, let me take again an example of orbits, which is the simplest case. If you just have orbits of the same dimension, which look kind of similar, I draw them like this. Then your, your moduli space would be just a transversal slice. Uh, so there's a theorem telling you that the orbits are manifolds, and they are essentially parallel. So you can do this at least locally. But globally. Globally, things are much more complicated. Assume now that the orbits are like this. And so on. Then you don't really know how to take your slice. Okay. So globally, you don't have problems. And this will show up again and again in our class the distinction between local problems and global problems. OK, we have a few minutes left. Uh, maybe I, I can use the last 10 minutes to give you one additional input, which is essentially due to maybe the philosophy of Grotendieck, and which is the following. Just a second. So <clears throat> Grotendieck's, one of Grotendieck's philosophies, of course there are many, was to look at objects always as members of a family. I repeat, when you want to study triangles, don't look at a single triangle. Look at the whole family of triangles. Now. You have to make clear what you mean by family. And there is a precise concept of family. So what does it mean to move in families? So let me call this number five, variation. 
in families. Okay. So when you when you modify or perturb an object, changing it slowly, then this should correspond to some continuous family. Still not precise, but for triangles, of course, you would just take, if you have A, B, C, the side lengths of triangle, then it's easy. Then you would just take a parameter t, and you would say a continuous family is a family of triangles where the side lengths depend continuously or differentiability, differentiably or algebraically or analytically on t. Continuous dependence on t. Okay. So uh, you can do this with all types of objects, but for instance, for groups, it's not so clear. Yeah? If you have algebraic objects, what is a family of groups. And when I talk about families, first I don't want to make it precise, I always say at least suppose it is continuous. Yeah? So are you allowed to change the object of the group? Are you just allowed to change the group law? Yeah? So you see, that's already much harder. So the the main the main definition of family is the following. Uh, that's a preliminary definition. Uh, let t be some parameter space. So this means either a topological space, or you just take the real lines, or the complex line, or you take an algebraic variety. But just think of the real line. A family over T of objects. And now we have to specify a category in a category. And what could we think of? What kind of category? You could take the category of vector spaces algebraic varieties, uh, whatever you feel like, okay, groups, is a morphism. So you assume first that your parameter space is an object of your category, is a morphism, let me write it like this, script x down to t, whose fibers xt so let me call this pi, pi inverse of t, are objects of the category. And usually, this uh, script x should also be an object in the category, and x also. Okay. So that's not uh, no, that's not true. So if you take a fiber vector bundle, maybe you should your category should be manifolds. Category manifolds, and the fibers are vector spaces, which are of course manifolds. This would be a typical example. And you can also do it for Algebraic varieties, curves, and things like this. Okay. And then, and that's the end of the story of today, but still I have to erase. Once you decide that you go for families, and it will turn out that this is a, a very powerful approach to study objects in families, because you will you will replace, in some sense, topology by families, yeah? then you need, an, need a notion of equivalent families. So 
that's one thing. So if you have x over t and y over s, when do you want to call them equivalent? Provided that you already have a notion of equivalence in your category. And then uh, the next and the last concept of today is a universal family. And a universal family is again a family, but which contains all other families of these objects, in the sense that for each equivalence class of objects, of equivalence class of families of objects, it contains at least one element. And instead of giving you the definition, which first I don't have time today, and second, I will do it later on. I will give you an, the example of, of elliptic curves. You don't have to know what an elliptic curve is, but what you should maybe uh, accept that they can be defined by cubic polynomials. Can be defined by polynomials of the form the y square equals x cube. I'm working over a field of characteristic 0 to simplify my life. ax minus b, ab in k. So every elliptic curve can be defined by such an equation for suitable a and b. So this is. If you take a and b now as variables, this will be your universal family. And if you want to take a concrete one, so a concrete family is the following. You take from your parameters p, you go to k2. t goes to a sub t, b sub t. Assume you are over the complex numbers of real, so this will be continuous. And the concrete family will be then given of elliptic curve will be given by the equation y squared equals x cubed minus at x minus bt. So for instance, here you could take maybe t cubed, and here you t minus 1. Then you would get y squared equals x cubed minus t cubed x minus t minus 1 times nothing. OK? So I hope that this gives you at least an idea what the universal family could be. OK, I am not completely through what I wanted to do today, but at least this was the starting point. Uh, so next time, I will continue with a little bit more concrete things. I will send you again an invitation on next Tuesday, and I will also send you the information what will be the program next week. OK. So I'm very happy that so many people joined us today. I hope that you are motivated to, to stay and uh, keep safe. And uh, I hope that we can share a little bit of mathematics together this fall term. Thank you, and goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Hasta luego. Hasta la próxima.